There's been a lot of talk lately about sandbox games and some of the communities that I'm in. Notably, the Knights of Last Call just did a stream on it, which I'll link down below. One thing I noticed is that the way everyone talks about things, they do things a little differently the way that I do. Not to say that I'm right and they're wrong, it's just I apparently have a little bit of a different perspective here, and maybe if I explain it, it might help you with your next sandbox game. The core is, what it boils down to is people. That, that's the takeaway here. It's people. It's figuring out who in your setting actually has the ability to do the things that might be able to move the plots, tweak things, and by focusing on the individual people involved, and they might not necessarily be people, they could be monsters, they could be all kinds of different things, but they're an entity that is somehow intelligent, that has a motivation that we can focus on putting up who they are, it can make your setting not only feel a little bit more alive, but it can also give it an element of versimilitude that's very hard to really take away by the players doing very crazy things. Let me explain. As DMs, we have a limited amount of time and we need to maximize the effectiveness of our prep. We can't infinitely prep everything. We can't build an entire world every single block at a time. And luckily there's lots of tools for us to really speed up our prep, to utilize the time that we do have to prepare in the most efficient way. There's generators, there's all kinds of different tools that we can uh, get either to get our juices flowing or to build us something from scratch. Even something as simple as using tropes. The game starts in Fantasy Village. You know the one. It's got a blacksmith. There's a forest nearby. There's a, an ancient something or other that is far enough away from the town that we don't go there all the time, but close enough that everyone knows about it and where it is. There's a, a road that goes from what we everyone here thinks is kind of the middle of nowhere, but there's a little bit of stuff nearby, and it goes to someplace bigger, someplace more important. That is our fantasy town, and it's not necessarily a bad idea to start there. And for the purposes of the discussion, we're trying to separate kind of the stuff that you can easily build up and generate from the things that should take a little bit more time and that you can focus on more that'll help you further down the road. One of the key parts here that makes sandboxing a little different or building something that is more sandbox a little different is that it's very difficult to plan step A and then get to B and to C and to D and go like that. Because a lot of times when we're planning these things or when modules or adventures or adventure paths are planning these things, they're planning them based on events. The players will do this and then they will do this and then this will happen and then this will happen. These events set up a timeline and that is very easy to write about. That's very easy to conceptualize for running a game, and sometimes it works. The problem is, is that this structure is very brittle. We can kind of fall apart if something happens in B and that makes D impossible, or even C, or the players decide once they get to A that really they figured out about P way over here and want to skip the whole group to get there, only to find out that there's an ancient red dragon at P and they're level two. So there's a lot of problems with trying to just mash something that is a linear adventure or something that in my opinion is more like a movie or a novel than it is to a D&D campaign into something that is inherently even more open-ended than a typical D&D campaign when you're making a sandbox. And I think one of the things that people fail at there is that they're focusing on the events rather than focusing on the motivations, the, the reasoning, the, the why. And I think it's very useful to consider those reasonings and motivations of why as dungeon masters as being people, being individuals. Pick a person that is their thing. And we do that a lot of times with important NPCs in these adventures anyways. One of the examples of is the Knights of the Last Call did a very good stream on uh, world building in a sandbox campaign, and they had an example of a bandit lord. And the bandit lord could have been an exile that was trying to make money. And if they didn't deal with the bandit problem, then the bandit lord would accrue enough stuff to be able to threaten a wider range. And maybe they were deposed, and maybe you might have nobility and things like that. And that isn't a bad way to go about it. I do like that. I've done that a lot before. But what I think is more interesting with a sandbox, and I think a more interesting approach, is rather than build up the events, the threats of, oh, over here there are goblins, over here there's a tomb, over here there are bandits, and if you don't deal with these things, they sort of build out, which is sort of like the idea of fronts. Hey, if you don't deal with the bandits here, they will do this, and then this, and then this, and it sort of builds. But if they do deal with the bandits here, and none of this other happens, you've sort of, you sort of lost that prep. 
probably not too much time, probably not too much energy has been expanded on going many steps along, uh, along the line. And just like in the stream, they'll talk about how you can make sure that you aren't wasting a ton of prep by not planning too many steps in advance. And that got me thinking, that got me thinking, how, how do I plan in advance in my sandbox? Because I do plan things pretty far out. And the answer is, I don't focus on the event. I focus on the people. I focus on the, the who rather than the what. I focus on who in the area has the ability to affect the system, who has the motivation to be able to get the job done. They, they want to do a thing. They desire an outcome. And then who has the means to do it? And there's some pretty simple pieces that I need to kind of put into place in order to make it work. I need to look at what NPCs in the area, and I typically pick maybe two or three in an area where the PCs are gonna talk a lot. In our starting fantasy town, we've got two or three people that are motivated, that have desires, that want to do a thing, and that the PCs might be able to help or hinder with it. And once we can figure out some of the pieces that we need for those NPCs, then we can sort of build everything up. And a lot of other locations, especially places where we don't expect to have a lot of people talking, or at least a lot of the adventures talking to people, you can say, okay, there's one thing here, or there's one or two things, or maybe there's one key person and then someone else who's missing one of the key pieces is linked to them as a lieutenant or something like that. Now, to be clear here, what I'm talking about is this pretty simple breakdown of kind of who and what and when and where and why, and they need to be identified. You need to be able to, one, see who they are. W who are they in the area? Is this the mayor? Is this the ancient lich that runs the tomb? Is this the bandit lord, the ex exiled noble? And then you need to find out what they want. They're the mayor. They want very simple things. They want the town to prosper. They want to be mostly left alone. And they want to be seen as an authority in their local area. Okay, well, what does the necromancer lord want? Well, that, that's an interesting one. That could be a lot of things. Maybe the necromancer lord wants to be left alone and people keep knocking on his door all the time. That guy is going to have a very different perspective than the one that is trying to raise an entire army to take over the world, to control everything in overflowing darkness. They're going to have different things, and those are going to be different adventures because of who that person is. Our exiled noble, are they a town drunk? Are they stuck in the uh, inn of some place where their 150 gold of that they were able to walk away from town in is going to or, you know, walk away from the bigger city in? That 150 gold could take them months, years in the country of living a very simple life and being able to just drink away their stupors. Does that person have anything that they're really motivated by? Maybe revenge, maybe something keys on them. Maybe there is an event that can be triggered, but it doesn't necessarily have to be something they're doing right now. These aren't the focal characters. These aren't the adventurers that need a reason to go out and adventure and to do things. They need to be NPCs that have the possibility of changing the world. They have the possibility of doing stuff. And it could be the bandit lord. They've gathered bandits to them and they're going to retake their, their rightful place in society. And you could do something like that. But you're gonna need to know what that is in the area. And I think building from those people is going to make your area feel more alive. And yes, you're still going to need uh, a vague map of the town, where everything is, what things are. You're gonna need to build encounters. You're gonna need to do a lot of the other basic pieces. But for me, when I'm focusing on how do I make this world feel like a place, the way that I do that typically isn't by these wonderful descriptions that I can come up with of places. I don't need to be Robert Jordan explaining the road for the 50th time or the, the flowing wind as it comes and it's not an end uh, or a beginning because there are no beginnings and ends to the wheel of time. That I don't need to worry about, honestly, because a lot of players sort of space out if you go on too long of a block text of a description of some place. What I need to focus on is who the NPCs are that they are going to interact with and how they're going to see the world develop. Now, one of the benefits here is if you have who they are, what they want, why they want it, how much they're willing to sacrifice to get it, if you can answer all of those things for, let's say, a dozen NPCs in the area, 
And that might sound like a lot, but once you start kind of breaking down people or pull out some tropes, it actually goes pretty quickly. Three in our starting town, maybe two in a local area that's a little further away, gives us five. Then we now need, say, seven places of interest. Or maybe you only need five places of interest and two of those five places have a lieutenant, someone that has a lot of the same sort of motivations, but their why they're doing it is attached to one of these other people. They can be good people that'll sort of lead us into the feel of the area. And once you have all of those pieces in place, and once you've built up these things, inevitably, when you put them on the map and you put their motivations in contest with one another, you'll see events happen. You'll say, okay, well, this guy wants this thing and this guy wants something that's kind of similar. Well, would they work together? Would they try to work on the same thing? Maybe you kind of like the exiled noble thing and you like it enough that maybe there's two of them. Maybe they're even possibly exiled for the same reason. The drunk that's in the bar and the bandit lord are not the same person. They're not two different iterations of the same idea. They're two different people. And if the PCs can get those people together, maybe the way that they were collectively wronged could be something that would change things. Now, the reason that I focus here is another interesting piece of DMing advice and DMing prep is, is that idea of waste, right? You, you don't want to waste stuff that you've built up. And when you build a series of events and you focus on what is going to happen and not why it's happening and what the sort of motivating people and what the pushers and movers think about what's happening here, that again is very brittle. It can fall apart and it's much harder to change an NPC's core values of who they are and what's going on. The players can kill them, of course, but even then, you're going to have other people that might attach their motivations. Or maybe the PCs killed the person well before they got to understand any of the motivations, and you can take that entire set of motivations and move it somewhere else. In the same thing, another piece of common advice is if you're running a sandbox and the players don't go the direction of the bandits, well, you can take the bandit encounter and you can repurpose it over here. But I've found that sometimes it's really hard. If you make very interesting adventures and you make very interesting encounters, sometimes you have this idea for there's in the woods and there are these traps and you have all these ideas of, uh, of trip wires and things and hidey holes in the trees for, for bandits with longbows and you can do all of that in the woods and it makes a lot of sense. And you have this sort of uh, Robin Hood, King of Thieves thing where the, the they, they pull up the, the greenery on one side and hide everything and the bandits are just completely invisible. And that works really, really good in the area that bandits know perfectly well, in the area that they always ambush people in. But if you try to repurpose that somewhere else, it gets harder to kind of plug in. The thing with NPCs and NPCs having motivations and having something that really explains who they are and why they are the way they are, why they act the way they act, is that if you take any of these pieces out, right, you, you pull any of these elements away, that NPC is still there. If you know who they are and how they function, you don't have to worry about your linear set of events falling apart because if one thing falls apart from the perspective of the NPCs that are around, then that just changes. And you can take a second and go, okay, that plan didn't work for an NPC that was trying to do something. We can use the example from the stream. Our guy is going to get this evil book of evilness and is going to use it to do X, Y, Z going down the line but I'm not gonna focus on those. Maybe I can focus on what the end goal is. The NPC wants to use the book to create an army, but why? Well, because the NPC wants power. Why do they want power? Well, maybe they grew up with nothing. They were a street urchin. And they, once they found out they had the ability to use magic, they had the capacity for power. They tried to find the normal ways of going through it and it didn't work. So there's this element of vengeance mixed in. There's this element of, of being wronged mixed in with everything here. And so everything that the, the necromancer does is tainted by this feeling of injustice on themselves, whether rightfully or wrongfully uh, attributed doesn't really matter for our NPC from the purpose and perspective of our character. So when we have that piece, oh, well, the players, the NPC is going to get this thing. He's going to get the book. He's then going to go to the next step. He's going to go to the cemetery and do these things. He's going to go to the next step. He's going to go do this once he's got the army. When you take away an element, when you're looking at the events, 
it can be really hard to figure out, all right, well, how do, how do I make this other part of this plot make sense? Or, man, did I just waste this whole cool graveyard encounter that I had built up? Well, no, because not only can you sort of repurpose that, if our necromancer guy failed, but he didn't die or has a way to come back or can still be involved in the story in some way, has a lieutenant or maybe has uh, research with other people and drawn the attention of other people to the uh, presence of this book, then with the idea of the person being the center here, they can adapt. They don't get what they want from the book. Do they go after the, the PCs? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they realize the PCs are too strong and they can't actually go after them. So they work with one of the other people. Well, wait a second. The bandit lord has people. He has the people to maybe threaten the PCs. What he doesn't have is the ability to reach out and touch the people who have wronged him. Maybe the bandit lord can make a deal with our necromancer, with our guy that failed to get his book, and the guy can trade resources for the ability to go and maybe do a curse on someone that has wronged the bandit lord. That would fit with that sense of injustice, this thing that has not been done correctly, right? The bandit lord, who was an exiled noble, has that feeling that, of being wrong that it can use to connect with this other NPC. And if we focus on building our sandbox around these people of, we'll call them people of power, they're really people that just have the desire on one hand, and then have the opportunity and resources on the other to be able to put those two things together, we can create conflict in the local area. And that conflict can build everything else around it. You don't need to necessarily worry about the exact pieces in the area until it's a little bit later down the line. Maybe you can use some of those random tools to generate a group of bandits. Cool, I need random names, I need random uh, sets of equipment, I'm going to have maybe a lieutenant here or there, we're going to kind of pull these things together, we've got some goblins, we've got all these other things, and you can even grab them just whole hog from a module. I'm going to have my starter village have right over here the moat house. Don't use the moat house, it's terrible. That whole adventure is just a giant F you. But you can take a module that's not something hate-filled for your players and plop it into your setting. And again, that goes back to the beginning. We had minimal effort to be able to put it into our setting. We're gonna get maximum rewards because we focused instead on the who and the why and putting people here and making the actions fit together about the people that are involved and how their motivations and what they want to have happen change the local area so that when the players are get introduced things and they start changing things, we know who these people are. And when the PCs inevitably encounter some of these people of influence, these people of power, then if we know who they are, regardless of what curveballs the players throw at us, we have a lens to view this through. This isn't just a person who knows this and this, and whose purpose is to get the characters from here to here to the event that we need. They aren't a key player in that event. They're a person who has their own motivations. And when you ask them about things that they're not supposed to be connected to, then if you know who they are, you can give a realistic reaction to it. And that's, for me, D&D. &D. We, can, we can play a choose your own adventure game by just going and playing one of those games. I can go into GURPS and go north until something happens. But for me to really enjoy D&D, I need to interact with something and I need the world to react to me in a believable way. And in my mind, a believable way means there's people that have motivations and there are people that have the ability to act on those motivations in the world in conflict or in concert with the actions of the PCs. And the last thing that we'll kind of talk about to kind of pull this all back together into why I focus on these so heavily is that time is limited. We've talked about not uh, wasting things, of retrofitting things or refitting things or refluffing or retextualizing, however you want to do, you're reusing content you've, you've put some other places. But there's another element to it. You can't always be sitting and typing at a computer or scribbling in a notebook or however it is that you do your structuring of your planning for your game. And for me, being people is easier to do on the move. I've got two little kids and for me, audiobooks have a whole new meaning than they did when I was younger and I had lots and lots of time. 
Audiobooks let me listen to things and move while I'm doing other things. I can listen to an audiobook while doing dishes or taking my kids to the park. Or I can think about being an NPC. If I have the basic elements of who they are, what they want, why they want it, and how much they're willing to sacrifice to get it. If I have those four pieces, then I can put myself into the head of that character and think about maybe what the PCs could do or maybe what the PCs have recently done. And then I can just sort of play around with it, mull it over. Think if I was that person with that series of traits, how would I react? What would I do? Would this be worth me engaging in? Would it be worth me changing to disengage from what the players are doing? And how I would approach that situation would be something that be very difficult to do sitting at a computer typing it down. I could definitely do it, but it allows me to not be sitting and typing. To be that person, I need to flesh them out as a person in my head. And that time that I can spend doing dishes or other sorts of things, just mulling through who this person is and how they talk and how they act, all that sort of stuff that a lot of people are gonna be doing anyways by DMing. If that is the way that I'm building my sandbox, if that is the way that I'm fleshing out this web and building outward, rather than building off of a map where there's a river here and a tomb there, and oh, the tomb might be higher level and there's a monster there, you can do that. But what's gonna make it feel living and breathing, what it comes down to, what it all boils down to in the end, is people. It's talking and seeing how they're motivated. And that's it, that's how I build my world. I start with the NPCs, I figure out who has the ability to do stuff and why they would want to do it. And then I connect all the dots. I connect the places like you'd connect anything else. The goblins are right outside of town so they can raid the farmlands. And the farmlands are right outside of town because they need to get things to market. And the road goes to the bigger city because it goes from another bigger city over here. It just goes through the town because that's the place where the town was built because that's where the road is. You have all these pieces that are physical landmarks that make tons of sense why they fit together. Those things can be easily, quickly generated. In my mind, a way that you can make this a unique feeling world, you can have something that the players will be dying to get back into and see how it works, is not to focus on those physical things. When you have your prep time, even if that prep time is away from your thing to write stuff down, it's thinking about the NPCs and how they're going to respond to things and building that web of maybe even very loosely connected or possibly not even connected, just adjacent interests, and then making that your world. And whenever the PCs do something that is a crazy curveball, you're not rewriting half the adventure because you're not writing out the events of what is happening. All you're doing is taking what they did and recontextualizing that for the people that would be affected by the actions of the PCs. And that will be the sandbox for them to all play in.